juries aren't, they're not deaf. They're hearing all about all these giant verdicts. And to say that that's not going to sway them in a different courtroom with a different set of facts, I think is foolish. Welcome to The Defense Never Rests with Morgan and Akins, your monthly dose of uncommon sense about all things legal and some that are not. Hi, welcome to this episode of The Defense Never Rests. Today, I am uh, joined with my partner, Oliver Brooks, who's going to be co-hosting with me today. How are you, Oliver? I'm good. Good morning. So today we have on Tom Harris, who's the VP of Claims of County Hall Insurance, which um, I'm really interested to talk to him. County Hall is a small and growing risk retention group um, that specializes in transportation. So, you know, he has a lot to say about uh, different exposures for his uh, insurance across the country, as well as the pains he's had to go through with growing a company during the wake of COVID and being remote from his team. So um, I think we had a really good conversation and I hope um, you know you enjoy. And of course, as always, if you like what you hear, uh, like and subscribe, uh, press the like and subscribe button below. So hi, Tom. Thanks so much for coming on Defense Never Rests today. Um, I, I'm so, so happy to talk to you today and interested to hear more about um, County Hall Insurance and you know how your company's growing. But before we get to there, I kind of want to get to know you, your background a little bit. Um, so the burning question I have is, did you always dream of being the VP of claims? <laughs> Was this your lifelong <laughs> goal? Like when you were a little kid, like, mommy, dad, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't be a major league baseball player, so it was my second choice. Uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you for having me, and I'm uh, glad to be here and to talk to you. Um, most people that I talk to, it's a little different now, uh, the way the insurance business is, uh, particularly the property and casualty business. Uh, but most people, as I, my term is, they fall into it. In other words, they're looking for a job. This is there. Okay, I'll give that a try, and they end up staying there for majority of their life or majority of their career, um, and uh, and that's how it happened. Most of the people I think you'll find, certainly of my age and my years in this business, would tell you that uh, insurance wasn't a career back then. It is now. I mean, there are courses being offered. Even I believe degrees are even. Uh, certificates in insurance and or risk management, as it were. But back when I started in this business, um, people got into it probably because they weren't sure what they wanted to do. Um, but they had obviously some skills. And I guess they found that those skills, and I did, I think, I believe, uh, that the skills that I did have transferred very well to insurance. Um, and that's that's how I got into it, and most of my colleagues, at least at this length of time, that's how they uh, became the VP of claim, as you uh, <laughs> mentioned, and how they dreamt of it. I dreamt of it after I got into it and was in it for about you know, a number of years, and I started dreaming about being a VP of claim, and right. had my own ideas about how to run a claim department and all of that. But. And, and what you know, what are your ideas on that? Like, how do you? What is your dream as to how you would like a claim department to run? Well, I, uh, I believe in communication. Uh, I believe the, uh, uh, the culture of uh, uh, working today in, in a business environment is a bit, a bit different, maybe even a lot different, actually. It was a very top down. Um, here's what you have to do and let me know when it's done. And there wasn't that collaboration component that I believe that you see now, and I believe that you need now, and I believe works far better. Um, I don't see myself now in a leadership role as somebody who gives out orders and waits for them to get done and then um, j just sits back and lets things happen. And if they don't happen, you uh, discipline someone. I believe in approaching and even communicating to my team and everybody I work with that we all want the same result. We're all striving for it. And I communicate expectations and then uh, monitor and provide feedback. Uh, and I believe it's a collaboration more than a top-down organizational structural hierarchy kind of uh, organizational uh, makeup. 
I mean, that kind of makes the project flow better anyway. If everyone feels like they feel if their voice is important and their opinion is important, it makes the, it makes the, the ship, you know, function more smoothly if everyone feels like they're part of the group rather than, oh, you know, Tom, Tom, my boss is right in my butt about getting something done. It, it means people have a little more ownership of what they do if they feel like they're a little more appreciated. Yes. I, I, I so, so Tom, do you, do you guys uh, break up your, your claims and risk management uh, uh, staffing based on, on what, how do you guys do that? Um, some, some do it geographically, some do types of claims, some do, sort of magnitude of claims, uh, complexity of issues, that sort of thing? The only segmentation we have here at County Hall is severity, really, of claims. Um, I know we're going to talk about County Hall in a little bit, but we are a small company. Um, and uh, the other companies I was with all were far greater in, in size than County Hall. And we'd have any number of ways of... Um, segmentation, as you put it. Uh, it could be geographical, it could be severity, uh, the skill set of the handler involved. I never got involved too much in risk management. I wanted to, and I felt that the claims person could be uh, an asset to risk management, although we had minimal interaction with them. Uh, but there could be any number of ways. It, it depends uh, a lot on the makeup of the company, the lines of business you're writing, skill sets of the claim handler, size, I mean, I, I can tell you Allstate is so big now, they don't even have a claim handler anymore. You just call and whoever answers the phone helps you, you know. Now, granted, Allstate is enormous, but it shows you the differences. You see, we have a very small claim staff. Um, so it just, it just depends on your organization and, your, uh, and, and how you want to accomplish what your goals are. And do you feel like with having... Yeah, and I, I ask that because cause a lot of what Megan and I do... Uh, is in the, the you know the the Philly metro, New York metro, New Jersey metro area, and sometimes we have we have claims adjusters from you know like Des Moines, Iowa, or something mm -hmm. that are you know they are really taken aback by the um, the complexity of of just the practice in this area and the exposure uh, of the the claims. I, that that's a, a somewhat routine issue that we have. We're lucky enough that in most of the cases we have, we have the same handful of, of claims handlers over and over and they, they know what's, what's going on. But, um, you know, they're like, you've moved the decimal point three times from what we assess the value of this. I'm like, well, it doesn't have, you know, the value that it's a different place, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and we, and as you probably know, and, and even in Pennsylvania, we, we can value uh, things rather dramatically differently, even county to county. Yes. Uh, it can be a huge difference. Um, so that, that's why I, I asked that. Understood. Well, going off of um, what you're saying about the, the size of County Hall and, and um, you know, the role of your claims adjusters, do you feel that you know, there was a more individual approach to each, each claim given that, you know, it, it's not just a dime a dozen. Like you, you get a lot more personal attention. Uh, we're trying to develop that. I believe um, we brought on somebody recently who was with uh, the organization, the, the predecessor organization, claim organization. Um, and I'd like to develop that over time. Uh, we're still evolving here. Uh, I have a, a great team. I have a great uh, manager who reports to me who, uh, has been in the business a long time, has managed this team, most of them anyway, for quite a, quite a number of years. And that's a, that's a great asset, obviously, for the organization. And I look forward to uh, strengthening and uh, redefining that in some respects. Not completely. I think it's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of assets to the organization there. But uh, we're going to continue to rework it and redefine it. The intention is to grow, so that'll be the challenge. Uh, to shape the claim, claim teams rather with the organization's growth over time. Uh, I look forward to partnering with the underwriting uh, management team uh, over time to, uh, to kind of understand what kind of risks we'll be writing given the expected growth and the, the intended growth of the, uh, the management team, the executive management team. 
So I guess this is probably where we should back up. So tell, tell us a little bit about County Hall, because it, it's a little bit of a unique situation, because it wasn't, a, a, from my understanding, it was an existing risk retention group that then was purchased, right? Yes. Uh, I was working for the Berkey organization uh, for the past eight years, and uh, I uh, was an AVP of claims there, and um, that was a small, it, it still is a smaller company, but was even smaller back then. And uh, I was brought on board to bring about, to bring on some people to uh, establish uh, two claims teams. One was commercial auto, the other was general liability. Um, and having done that, it, it, I came, I met up with uh, a mutual friend of the current owner of County Hall and myself, and I, who I had actually known uh, not well, but had known and worked with very briefly in the past because both of them were that were at a predecessor defense firm. And he mentioned to me that this uh, that the current owner was uh, in the process of acquiring County Hall, and that uh, he needed someone to head up the claim group. And I expressed my interest. He put us together, and two days later, we met on a Saturday afternoon, and I was offered the position and. Uh, I'm very excited ever since because I knew that it would be uh, an opportunity to really take something from the ground up and grow it um, based on the conversations that uh, I had with uh, the current owner. And um, so that's, that's what happened. And County Hall, just to give you some uh, understanding of it, is a trucking liability only carrier. Uh, we write in most states not California, there are a couple others that, uh, not Alaska, Hawaii, and um, uh, I think there were a couple others. I got this list the other day. <laughs> so um, my experience at Berkeley taught me, you, you, got, you alluded to before the exposures in New York, New Jersey, where I had worked extensively in my prior career, uh, but you should see some of the exposures in Illinois, California, Florida, which is a very dangerous place to work, Louisiana, um, I thought working in New Jersey was bad until I hit these other states. It's not nearly as bad as some of those others, but you need to get out and work in these other venues to understand that. Uh, and that gave me a great uh, understanding of uh, the country as a whole, trucking liability. It's, it's been a valuable experience. And uh, so that, that's, that's where we, uh, that's a little profile of County Hall. But the interesting part is you made this jump in the middle of, of COVID, right? Well, the, converse, the conversations that we had to, that I accepted the uh, position were right before the lockdown occurred, which I was still at Berkeley. My last day in the office was, I believe, March 15th or so. And I, these conversations I'm referring to where I accepted the position were in the latter part of February, I believe, on or about February 21st or 22nd. So we were, it was out there, but it was nothing like it is now and was like in say three or four weeks from the date that we had this conversation. So it was, yeah, it was right on the edge. Uh, and when I departed, everybody was working at home already. Mm -hmm. uh, although I don't believe it was seen to be a, a permanent rather arrangement, but so it was right on the cusp of uh, COVID-19. So, you know, you come on and now you're getting, you're in this new role, but everyone's remote, <laughs> everyone's yes. at home, yes. and you pretty much have to hit the ground running to help start, you know, build this company. So what sort of struggles have you experienced in, in this climate trying to do that? Well, you, you mentioned it. Now, just a little bit further background, the claims for County Hall were being handled by a third party administrator known as Criterion Claim Services. Uh, I was brought on board prior to the actual completion of the sale to the current owner. Um, the completion of the sale was expected to uh, be completed sooner than it was. There were some delays, I presume because of COVID-19 and there were some other administrative uh, issues that were unresolved and took longer than everybody expected. So I was brought on board in early May. Uh, the claims are still being handled by the Criterion folks. We then made the decision to bring almost all of them over to become County Hall employees. So I got a chance to uh, understand how they were doing things, understand the, com the company somewhat. So in the first week of July, we uh, 
the sale was completed and people were offered employment at County Hall and now we all are County Hall employees. And that began the further development of uh, uh, the current claims staff and the direction. Uh, I'm in constant communications with the team. The biggest issues are, is I wanted to go out to, the, okay, let me back up. You mentioned geographic and all of that. Um, all of those folks, except for the newest one, are located in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where Criterion had its, uh, its offices. Uh, now everybody has been working at home for quite a long time out there. My desire and what I would have done in the past was make a, uh, a visit to these folks in person because I, I believe in a person to person contact, which COVID-19 has uh, pretty much eliminated for, the, for now, uh, certainly in that kind of setting. So I, I held daily Zoom meetings with uh, the meeting, uh, with the manager, excuse me, and one other individual to get to know them better. And then I've begun, then I began rather uh, holding Zoom meetings with the, quite, in the entire team, communicating my expectations, uh, trying to get them to know me, trying to create the feeling of a collaboration that we touched on before, uh, that I was not there to start giving out orders and to overturn everything. They had had a number of layoffs, which I referred to and touched on in my uh, Zoom meetings with the team, that I understood that that was uh, difficult for them to go through and that now the changeover from them moving from Criterion to County Hall was also something that was going to be difficult for them. Just a lot of changes all at once, uh, uncertainty. Uh, but I had information that I knew could do the best job of reassuring them that their futures were not threatened by these changes and that I looked forward to working with them, which uh, now is seemed to have uh, uh, paid off when the goal was to get from 700 open claims in, I believe, January, which was prior to my joining, to be to getting our open claims are pending to under 400, which are on the cusp of doing. And so I think that that says a lot about the work of the staff there in light of all of these issues. I mean, I can feel their, um, you know, their, their feelings of apprehension, because at the time, I think everyone was kind of feeling, feeling that with the uncertainty of what was going on, as well as just, you know, you're, you're reading the news and the job market is falling to pits and then stock market is falling and everything just seemed like it was, Falling, so I can certainly uh, appreciate their 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 apprehension. So I mean, how how were you able to you know reassure them that you know being far? You know, I know you're having these meetings, but sometimes you know someone can say something and they they really still might be feeling very uncertain about you know their future. Um, so how how were you able to go about doing that to reassure them that you know yeah this is going to work out. I know there's a lot of a change right now, but trust me. <laughs> uh, I also had some help from the manager there who knew all of these folks quite well. Uh, and he shared my, um, uh, my vision of the claims team and the fact that we were secure. Uh, and, uh, he, he helped out quite a bit with that. The owner, the current owner then began sending out communications also. So it wasn't just me. So they had it on multiple fronts. I think the, maybe the most important piece was the, the manager, the claim manager, Mike, who uh, they had known for quite some time when he and I had been discussing any number of things. When uh, I believe that they looked to him for uh, reassurance more than me, who they didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that between that, between my, my own meetings and the owner, then when he began sending out the offers of employment with County Hall, uh, I think that that was, uh, that, that was the biggest reassurance. Of course, they went through a period of time, even before I was on board, of not knowing what was going to happen. Um, I should mention that those folks were handling more than just County Hall claims. Uh, they were handling a number of other programs uh, most of which exited criterion res resulted in a lot of layoffs, which I talked about before. So uh, for them to have uh, uh, ambivalent feelings about the future is, was clearly understandable. And I talked about that with them. I said, I know you probably feel threatened, you know, all these layoffs and all of that. So I, I tried to uh, project the idea that I was clearly aware of what they went through and what they were feeling. 
So you work hard at that. So Tom, do that. Tom, <clears throat> when you guys get a, uh, a new claim in, uh, let's say it's, it's, a, it's not in suit yet, you've just gotten notice from uh, either a, a claimant directly or, or even uh, they've retained counsel um, that, that there's been, you know, let's make up a scenario, uh, a, a significant injury has been incurred due to a trucking accident and they're contemplating putting the, the issue in suit. That, you know, what's, what's the first thing that, that goes through your head and, and what's the first sort of plan of action that, that uh, you would, would sort of want implemented by one of your, your claims handlers? The first order of business is to be sure that it's a covered loss. That there's nothing more important than to determine whether or not this is a covered claim. So uh, the claim handler's first responsibility is to do exactly that, to investigate, to see. Now our policies, and these are different than the per Berkeley policies and the others, they generally have uh, a schedule of vehicles and a schedule of drivers. We have to, the claim handler has to determine if in fact both the vehicle and the driver is scheduled on the policy. And then also based on the facts, if, if, that's, if those two components are in place, then also uh, be, uh, be sure that the facts speak to a covered loss. If it is a significant loss, uh, the manager and I would then agree upon who to have this uh, handled by. Uh, and that claim handler would then go through these steps that I just mentioned. Uh, we want to have a, a thorough investigation. Occasionally, we have people who are uncooperative with our investigations. That's that really is a challenge for us. We, some of our insurers just I, I'll I'll just throw it out there. They just don't care that there was an accident. They don't want to be bothered. They really just don't. Uh, some do and some don't. Uh, we had less of that in my experience in my pre prior uh, career. But here, some of the uh, risks we write uh, just don't care. Um, oftentimes, an independent adjuster is uh, brought on board, particularly with a serious accident, as maybe you referred to, to uh, maybe uh, get some photographs of the vehicles. I mean, oftentimes we're presented with a property damage claim, so we want to understand that piece of the claim. Um, and we want to understand if there is anything else that we don't know. We don't often have a police report for some time. Uh, so we want to get our investigation done as quickly and as efficiently as possible so we understand our exposure. Um, so that's, that's ordinarily the uh, lion's share of what needs to be done in order for you to understand what, you need, uh, what your exposure is and then to set your appropriate reserves, which is always the moving target. Yeah, yeah. So, so with with pre litigation uh, or pre suit, I call it uh, uh, matters. Um, do you necessarily involve counsel at that point, uh, or, or is it entirely handled uh, within your uh, your claims department? Because there, there's there are, there seem to be kind of two different split ethos uh, as to how that that works. Some of our clients love to get us on from the word go. They may say don't do anything yet, but we want we just want to put this bug in your ear, or we want to, you know, get get a a, a a twenty minute overview. What do you think we should do? Others they don't want us to do anything. They don't tell us about it until rather late, uh, which uh, obviously we don't like as much. But sometimes that's a, another effective way to do it. Uh, if the claim involves a fatal fatal injuries or injuries that out of the gate that we understand to be significant damages because damages run cases. You can argue liability forever, but damages are the biggest component of, of cases in our business. Uh, if the damages were significant, if we had a fatal accident, uh, it's my um, opinion that counsel should be involved at the outset. I say that for a couple of reasons. And there's dispute among this, uh, uh, about this rather, but uh, I, I'm of the understanding that in some jurisdictions that the investigation then is privileged because if defense counsel uh, directs the investigation, it is seen as a client, attorney client privilege. Uh, there's dispute about, about that though, but nevertheless, it's my feeling that I, uh, I'm in favor of that. And also because if the injury is significant, we're gonna get a spoliation demand for, uh, a demand to inspect our vehicle, insurance vehicle, and any other number of things. And, I prefer to have counsel 
involved early to address those demands from the other side, um, to arrange a, a download of the black box or what have you, uh, could involve retaining an expert at the outset. But I, I'd prefer to have counsel involved in cases uh, involving fatalities or very, very significant injuries that on our face, you know, you have a problem with. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, obviously, maybe I'm a little biased because I would be the attorney doing it. But, you know, I think having an attorney with their feet on the ground at, at the scene you know, as soon after the accident as possible to interview witnesses and, you know, kind of start to control the dialogue as early as possible. I think it, it just, it, you're off, you're, I think you're stepping off at a better, better footing than if you were to do it down the road or when, when you see, get hit finally with the complaint. I mean, at, le at least at this point, you, you have an edge up. Um, at least that's my opinion. I think Oliver probably would agree. Um, yeah, and, and in addition to that, you know, a lot of our cases are uh, heavily emphasizing uh, expert testimony. Um, you know, we, we have, I do an awful lot of products liability work. Uh, Megan does a lot of uh, commercial trucking. Those two things overlap each other a lot. And, and a lot of the evidence, if it's going to come in at the time of trial, has to come in through a qualified expert. And, and you know, some of the times we find that the, the insured provides uh, an expert, whether it be to download the, the you know, event data recorder or to uh, examine the, the vehicle, which may be repaired, may be scrapped, may be lost, or to do a scene inspection. And sometimes we find that those, quote, experts are not actual experts, or even if they are, they may have, they may be easily undermined by, uh, by calling into question their bias because they collect a paycheck from the very same uh, entity that that you know is a potential defendant in that case so we like to have some some whenever possible some say in in what's going on I'm not saying that we shouldn't involve insurance personnel who had knowledge of this stuff but we also need to have a, someone that is a little bit more on its face on his or her face rather a uh, an impartial expert as if that ever was a thing in litigation um, yeah. So yeah, we want to be involved as early as possible. We are biased, but I think that's a smart way to do it. Um, well, and I think that uh, Oliver kind of just touched on that. I think that's one thing that is really interesting about the transportation industry because it is kind of a, you know, a, a crossover between both. You know, you see products claims as much as you see, you know, motor vehicle or you know, trucking accident claims. At, with fatalities, like it's, it kind of encompasses a lot of these big players we see in litigation that are very costly um, on the exposure side and on you know the defense costs side. So having said that, I mean when you you get one of these you know fatality, say you get a fatality claim involving one of your truckers, I mean what what is keeping you up at night when <laughs> when you when you get something like that in? Well, one of the uh things that I've noticed with the, uh, the risks that are written by County Hall is that oftentimes you have uh, contracts, leases, bills of lading between our own insureds and others. And um, you, have, you have risk transfer or you, it's unclear as to who the liable party is. Uh, uh, the drivers, independent uh, owner operator drivers and all that. It, it muddies the water about who truly are the defendants in the case, and therefore then muddies the insurance coverage and the amount of coverage uh, I've been finding out. Some of the cases I took on directly to handle because they were uh, very messy, uh, I noticed that that occurs a fair amount of time. Uh, so that's, that's, that's something that's very uh, concerning to me. I have one particular case, I won't take up too much time with it, but Essentially, it's a, an accident where the plaintiff was in the hospital for like six months and he had a load of injuries and then sustained a stroke while he was in the hospital. His medical bills are over two, over $2 million. Well, we have a million dollar policy, but we're towing a vehicle for, uh, towing a trailer rather for somebody. Uh, I won't bring up any names here, but uh, uh, a well-known uh, company in, in, in the world, actually. But 
plaintiff naturally doesn't want to just take our million dollars and go away for obvious reasons. So they go fishing for more coverage and then we get into the muddiness that I just referred to before about how much coverage is available for this case and with these other parties and then they're tendering to you and then you got to determine whether or not the tender is proper. And if it is, then how can you extricate yourself from these cases in these tough situations? Mm -hmm. uh, Cause we don't carry any excess at all. Um, I don't know if that's the, if there's a plan in place at some point to do it, but we don't. And our insurers generally, from what I can see, they don't uh, buy any excess coverage. So that's what keeps me up. <laughs> that would keep me up too. <laughs> you don't want an excess of coverage. You. No, you just don't. I mean, but you could be faced with it or you could be faced defending somebody who's not your named insured for a long period of time while the plaintiff attempts to, uh, create a theory of liability against someone in order to find more insurance coverage for somebody with catastrophic injuries. So that's, that's, that's what's keeping me up. Yeah. I've, I've seen that happen a, a lot before with, you see a lot of very creative um, arguments in order to tap into additional policies um, for, for that, that reason. I've seen it, it happens a lot in construction I've seen. Um, and I mean, I guess kudos to them to being creative, <laughs> but yeah. it doesn't make our job any easier. <laughs> right, right. No, yeah, I mean, us. just just a couple of years ago, I, I handled a, a case uh, in New Jersey where um, my client was the manufacturer of industrial water purification equipment. They built these gigantic tanks that have like uh, activated carbon charcoal filters. It's for post manufacturing waste to be rendered safe enough to put into municipal waste. Um, and they built this thing somewhere in the South. I don't even remember now, Mississippi or Arkansas, I guess Arkansas is not really South, but um, at, at any rate, uh, and an independent contractor, you know, pulls his low boy trailer in, they put these, these two giant tanks on the back of this thing and the, and the, the trucker heads to New Jersey with the thing. You know, the trucker's completely independent. He plotted the route. He secured the oversized load uh, uh, permits, uh, the whole nine yards. But but this knucklehead ran the thing underneath a low overpass mm -hmm. and knocked oh, these these twin uh, tanks off. And they, they're, they're enormous. The, these two tanks maxed out the, the legal load for the, the truck, uh, weight-wise. These things go, you know, flipping down the highway, and they flatten multiple cars oh, on the road, wow. seriously injuring a number of people. And, of course, my client, the manufacturer of the tanks, is brought in as a defendant. Of in an Everybody gets invited to the party. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean... You know, and, and the, the trucker is making a, a tender demand of us. Like, well, you know, what's, what's your theory? We should have made them smaller. I mean, <laughs> uh, or lighter. I don't know what the, what the, or not let you take them. You know, I, I don't know what the, what the theory is, but we, we ended up defending that for like three years of litigation. Um, and in the end, we, we contributed to the, to the resolution, but it was a very small percentage. I mean, I think it was 5%. Uh, and and the, the cost of litigating that was certainly, on our end, was certainly way more than the, than the cost uh, of contribution. Well, and, um, and that, that's the problem, right? So you have, even if you are like a, a very minor player, like Oliver's example there, you know, you may be, in the fight for you know a huge amounts of defense costs and expert costs just to get out for you know a, a minimal amount so having said that what is you know your philosophy um for your own insureds you know in those situations do you when you're faced with these enormous defense costs probably a catastrophic injury but your liability is just not there yeah, well, I have a saying that every case has a price. Um, due to the fact that you have expert fees and defense costs and expenses to um, consider when you evaluate what your plan is to resolution, to, to resolve rather, uh, any case. Uh, they're all different. I don't mean to uh, be vague, but they are all different. 
Um, you have to consider any number of things. The venue, as I think you, you referred to before, uh, what kind of a witness, whoever your witness is, whoever that individual is or individuals are, you got to evaluate how they would testify. Um, look at your defense counsel um, and any number of things. Uh, but they're all different, really. Um, but the I is to resolve cases. I mean, that's that's the goal here. We want to resolve them. Uh, trials are obviously uncertain. Um, we've seen all kinds of outcomes of trials. Uh, I think it's scary for both sides, even though the plaintiff side, I think, doesn't like to admit that they're scary, but they can be. Yeah. Uh, but again, you have to you have to weigh any number of things. But I always am concerned about cases with big damages because juries feel sorry for people who are horribly injured, particularly if they're still alive and wheeled out in front of them. That's that's a big consideration. Yes. And I think, you know, I, I think you and I had talked about this before, too. I mean, these nuclear verdicts and the inflation, the social inflation that happens as soon like juries aren't they're not deaf they're hearing all about all these giant verdicts and to say that that's not going to sway them in a different courtroom with a different set of facts i think is foolish you know they just sometimes things seem to become the norm in their eyes and you, you always run that risk that you know it they're just going to run away with it if they you know want to punish either your insured or just feel bad for the plaintiff in whatever situation that plaintiff may be in I agree. And then they, the plaintiff's bar employs the reptile theory. Uh, they drag your insured in, certainly in a trucking setting, they drag your insured in and talk about their hiring practices and their safety features, none of which has anything to do with the accident in question. So yes, that's, that's all a consideration. Yeah, it's all like cloud, trying to cloud their minds and throw, throw as much shit as they can at the wall <laughs> to make, you know, make the water murky. So they just are like, well, they're just a terrible company. I just want to punish them. <laughs> Right. And yeah, Tom, just so you know, I, I would never use a word like that. I, I don't, I don't. Speak <laughs> that. Me neither. <laughs> but do you, so, do you ever um, counsel your insureds at like, you know, certain practices that they, they can take to at least try to lower their potential risk? Well, that's going to be the goal going forward with our risk management folks who I'm not, I don't, I, I still want to get a definition on uh, what their uh, vision is and what their role is. And I've discussed this with them a couple of times because it seems as if they were doing some claim functions, but I'm more of a, uh, the opinion that they should visit our insureds and look at their hiring practices. Are they checking the driving records of these drivers and all of that? Now, I, I don't know how that can be accomplished and I realize that there's a, a cost involved but as we grow, that's going to become important. Um, we want to be conscious of the fact and we want to drive home the fact that you must, that our insureds must be conscious of what they do in the back office as well as what they do on the road. It's important, very important, because this all, it all speaks to the reptile theory. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, it, it, there's documentation issues a lot in these cases mm -hmm. where, yeah. where, you know, it, the client will come to us and say, we did this. We do it in every single case. We do it in every single instance. It's it's a matter of course, but we don't write it down. We don't have proof. And that's a major problem uh, because there is, like it or not, there is an, a, an assumption that if someone didn't, didn't document this in this giant, sophisticated company, which often it is not, it's often a, a rather uh, small insular group of people running these companies. Um, there's this assumption that if they didn't document it, it never happened. And this guy is just saying that uh, as a self-serving, you know, he's protecting his neck in this case. And um, so I, I always try and have my clients build a, a thorough document retention and document destruction policy. You know, you got to have both. Um, you don't need to keep, keep somebody's uh, payroll records who retired in 1985. Um, you know, maybe you can, maybe, maybe your, your computers are set up to where that's not an issue, but a lot of these, these small companies, you know, it's, it's, it's in file cabinets. You know? Right. Right. That's quite right. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge, obviously. 
Um, documentation is key. But the, the problem too with documentation though, if they, ha if they have a system they document, they have to actually keep following the system. Right. Because <laughs> that's the problem I see a, a oftentimes too. Like, well, we, ha we have this procedure in place that we document, you know, every time, this, every time we inspect the vehicle. Well, where's the inspection for this date? Oh, well, you know, John must not have done it that day. Well, then that's a problem because <laughs> then your documentation system just so don't time you don't do it. <laughs> like, and I, unfortunately, I think, you know, with it happens more often than not with, you know, companies that might maybe are on the smaller side and aren't as organized with, you know, crossing their T's and dotting their I's are the ones who tend to let those systems kind of fall to the wayside. And it can be, it can be overly detrimental if they're, you know, it could turn a smaller lawsuit into a giant lawsuit with, you know, one little slip of forgetting to, you know, and keep an inspection record that they say they always do. I think Oliver had that situation not so long ago in a case, right? Didn't he? It, 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 there's several of them, not, not just one. You know. Like, I mean, my, my, my grandfather was an operating engineer. He ran, you know, uh, heavy equipment backhoes, uh, front end loaders, bulldozers, and the company that he worked for did their own transport. They had, they had two or three um, tractors and several trailers. And, you know, if you're putting an 80,000 pound bulldozer onto a low boy trailer, um, you, you really should make sure that it's secured and that uh, all yeah. of your lights are working. I mean, basic stuff that, you know, and they did these things, but they did not keep very good records of this. They, they're, they're very lucky that they never had a, a, a significant claim. But can you, I can just imagine a scenario where, you know, going down the highway, Mr. Bulldozer now t tips over onto the road yeah. and, yeah. It's a problem, and, and you know, the driver who, in, in the case of the company my grandfather worked for, was most of those guys were straight out of the central casting for, like, you know, the Hell's Angels. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I checked it. And the jury's gone, really? You sure? <laughs> um, Understood. So, yep. so having a, a means of documenting it is important. And with today's technology, I think it's almost inexcusable not to have uh, accurate records. I mean, you can have a tablet in every truck that goes to the cloud. You know, yeah. you can have reminders that ding and tell, tell even the, the most wily of, of employees, hey, don't forget to do this. Yeah. Um, so that, those are my, that's my rant for the day. <laughs> at least the first of my rants for the day. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> so once you've got, you've got counsel involved, whether that's at a, at the pre suit stage or you've got a, a uh, an action that's been initiated, whether it's state or federal court, uh, what, what do you, what's the first thing that you want your lawyers to do for you to make your life easier? Um, in, in other words, it, Within the first 30 days, what do you want from them? Because this varies wildly from carrier to carrier. It might not be in 30 days. 30 days is a tough time frame, in my view. Uh, I would err on the side of 45 to 60 days. We'd like an initial report that um, mm -hmm. summarize everything that we're up against at that time, realizing also that we don't have everything, particularly if we're not even in litigation. Um, and we may not have a lot, but whatever we do have, we'd like encapsulized in that, that initial report. That's, that's critical for the claim handler to understand uh, what the exposure is, certainly based on known information at that moment, to set a reserve and to then work with the defense counsel uh, on an action plan going forward. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's what we would like. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, a phone call, a phone conversation about that. What I've read your report. I think we should do this. What are your thoughts and a, and a collaboration on uh, the action plan? Yeah, I would agree. I think that 45 to 60 day mark is kind of like the sweet spot that you're able to, you're able to figure out enough. You're able to assess on a, on a grand scale, what you're looking at and what you need to do and at least make an initial, okay, this is, 
this is what we should do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten next to get us to, you know, where we want to be. Um, and we tend to try to always do that, like on our bigger cases, it's the 60 day mark to have, you know, a really good outline of what's to come. Yeah, I concur with that. 45 to 60 is better than 30 days is just too soon. You just don't know. And oftentimes, even after 60 days, if it's a fatal accident, you're not going to have a police report yet, likely. Um, you're not going to know if there'll be criminal charges against your driver, if, if it's an automobile, a commercial auto setting. Uh, there are a lot of things you still don't know and won't know for a period of time. Um, so that's why 30 days to me is, is a bit soon. Uh, we'd all like to have everything all at once, but you don't. And in the, the pre-suit stage, a lot of what you're getting is advocacy from the other side. So, you know, they often don't give you the, the negatives of their case. Um, so you, we're, we're in a position of having to explain that we are assuming all of what they say to be true for our exposure analysis here. Uh, however, it, it, it could go, it could change somewhat dramatically uh, depending on uh, what, what comes of this, uh, from discovery. So, um, yeah, I, I personally like to, to just call opposing counsel and say, what are we looking at here? And most of them I found will be pretty candid. Of course they advocate, you know, they may inflate things a little bit, but they're often they're like, uh, I'm not making a demand. This is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, just that's all I can say right now. I don't have the full damages to make a demand. Other times they'll say, yeah, I'll get you a demand. This, this is a reasonable one we can probably work with. Um, we probably don't need to go, uh, you know, the nuclear option on this one. Um, but it, that alone gives you a big flavor of what, of what you're dealing with. And that, that has to do with our relationship with the, uh, firms that we often cross paths with on our end. Um, and that's my pitch for, for us as local counsel for you there. Okay. So no. with that, <laughs> so what, what is, what's next for County Hall? I mean, you guys are, you're expanding. So, you know, what do you foresee in the next, you know, six, 12, 18 months um, for, for your company? Where are you going? Um, growth. Uh, in conversations with the owner and the underwriting managers that they expect to write some more new business. Uh, I'm not sure what their goals are for renewals. I presume that at some point uh, they'll have to come up with such goals um, for both renewals and new business. How much of that do they expect to write over that coming time frame you just mentioned? Uh, with that, the result of that will be more claims. Um, but our caseloads right now are very manageable. So even with that growth, we expect the claims team, the current claims team to be well positioned to handle uh, certainly an initial influx of new claims. Um, we touched on before the risk management piece. I'd like to see some definition as to how they could address some of these uh, record keeping and driver records and all of that. Uh, type of uh, documentation and information. I'd like to see that uh, get more well-defined and have a plan for uh, expanding that because I think it would pay off. Um, right now, we don't even have an HR department. I expect at some point we'll have that. Um, so a a any number of uh, areas where we grow, we have to, we have also, I, and I'm working on this, we have to incorporate uh, a fraud vendor because we need some uh, filings in certain states with a fraud plan, an SIU uh, plan, and uh, we need some training in some states that needs to be administered by an approved SIU vendor. Uh, we have to work on uh, strengthening of our licensing, which has fallen off since the recent layoffs where the claims team was previously. Uh, I've, put a, I've, uh, I've gotten all of the people uh, aware of that and have given them instruction as to how uh, rather that that needs to be done. And I've also talked about why, because if we have a, com a consumer complaint in a state, the first thing that state's going to do, if in fact it's required to see if that adjusts license, that's the first thing they'll do. 
And regardless of the validity of the complaint, uh, there'll be issues if the adjuster doesn't have a, uh, right. a valid license that's uh, current. Um, so we have to work on getting all of those things. We have to um, establish uh, a database of our approved defense counsel, which uh, is, we're gonna work on that. We had, we brought somebody back to do our legal bill review process. Uh, she was doing it previously, but then it was a temporary arrangement. We brought her back, she's done great. Um, so all of these things need to be addressed and then also evaluated as we grow. Yeah, and, they, and hopefully you'll get to visit your team. <laughs> yes, and that too, yes, I'd, I'd really like to do that. I, I, you know, going on a, taking a, a flight right now to me is uh, too scary to do. And plus, even if I were to get past that fear, what would, where would we go? How would we meet? They don't even have an office right now. Right. Uh, but that's something else we're looking at too, is a smaller office space in downtown Omaha for these folks. Uh, when and if the, I, I shouldn't say if, when the time is right for them to be back in an office. I, I believe that you need to be in an office. Um, Working at home is great, but it's, it's got issues as well. Oh, sure. I, I experience those challenges every day. I, my, in the middle of this, my daughter came in and was standing next to me. I had to put everyone on mute <laughs> so you wouldn't hear her talking. <laughs> so trust me, I get the everyday challenge. <laughs> yes, yes. I, 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 I believe in, and we, you know, mediations by Zoom, they're okay, but they're just not, there's nothing that substitute for being there in person, being with your defense counsel, the mediator, the plaintiff, counsel, maybe the plaintiff him or herself, maybe the plaintiff's family. There isn't anything that substitutes for that. Zoom is, I guess, better than just telephone. Right. But uh, nothing, Not much. nothing, nothing is better than being personally there, uh, particularly for a difficult or, or large exposure type case. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah, and, and Oliver recently had one too that didn't counsel virtually walk out. <laughs> oh my God. It, it's, it, it's a, it's a modest exposure case. It's a fatality, but it's it's of modest exposure just because of the the facts of it. Um, and uh, the demand is astronomical. It's it's tenfold what the cases were. And uh, we we you know we go through six hours of mediation, and uh, they don't come off their demand, and they just leave. You know, it's, and it's one of these things where you're like, why, why did we even bother with this? And for, for the plaintiff himself, uh, the, the executor, um, it, it's one of the first times he's had to ever do anything in the suit. He answered a couple of, of interrogatories. He signed a complaint. Uh, but he really hasn't done, done much. And I guess that's the way it's supposed to be. His lawyer does almost all the work for him. But all, there's a difference between having to, you know, get cleaned up and go into a mediation, mediator's office to sit and have the, the like gravity of the situation soak in than there is to do what we're doing right here today and just point and click and go, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm playing Angry Birds on the other screen here or something, you know. Um, so I think having them, I, I agree with you in, in entirely in person is a big thing. It also prevents people from walking out. Um, the mediator well, I wouldn't say it prevents it, but it deters it. It, it, it lowers the, the percentage yeah. of that. It lowers the probability of that occurring. Sure. Um, yeah. So I don't want to take much more of your time, but I have one, one final thing. So you are obviously very, very busy. Um, but do you get to do, do you do anything for yourself for fun? Like what, what does Tom do to relax? <laughs> well, because of COVID-19, we've been kind of stuck here. Um, but prior to that, I love to travel. Uh, I have a place in Florida that I love to visit and, uh, uh, I'm a big baseball fan and I love to follow the game and the history of it and all that. And, um, uh, I have a son living in China who, um, is, uh, his business is to um, uh, teach people English mm -hmm. from all over the world. He's got a platform where that he can uh, market himself as a instructor of English to any to anyone of China, mostly Chinese. But he's fluent in a number of languages. We talked to him last night on Skype, and it's it's fascinating when he talks to somebody in another language, and he's tightening up his knowledge of uh, Chinese. And he's also developed a uh, a website for uh, marketing and selling camping equipment, something I never do, but 
Uh, we've gotten involved with some of the returns here and sending them out, so we're helping them with that. So we, we, uh, we enjoy doing that here. And, um, and I live at the Jersey Shore, so, and I love it here. And um, uh, so I enjoy doing all of those things. Yeah. And ha have you been able to get down to your place in Florida at all? Or have you been? Uh... We've stayed away from the boardwalk for this summer. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the beach. We, we've, we've stayed away. I know people have gone, but uh, I talk to other people who live in neighboring towns. And, um, and Point Pleasant itself is a very commercialized area, uh, if you know it. Uh, and um, I've made, we've made the decision to avoid the beach and boardwalk this summer. Yeah. Which is a shame, but, you know, kind of what is necessary at this point. Right. That, that's, that's our decision. Some people haven't, and that's fine. I mean, uh, they, they see it differently, but we've made that decision and that, that's what we're going to do. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I really enjoyed um, chatting with you this morning. Um, and I, you know, I loved hearing everything about that County Hall is doing and how, how you're growing. So thanks for taking some time out of your day and sitting down and, you know, talking to, to Oliver and I. Yeah, and and you know, send us send us some cases. That'd be great. You know, we're uh, we're we're reasonably priced, and I think we're pretty good. So, well, you know. yeah, let's uh, talk again offline, and um, let's yeah. let's discuss that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming on. Okay, it was a pleasure for me. I appreciate it. And um, uh, anything else I can ever do in the past, uh, in the future, rather. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, I enjoyed this. And if you want to do it again on any specific subjects, I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to participate. Sounds good. Great. Yeah. I'd love to know how you can help us with things in the past. <laughs> uh, the past. Yeah. <laughs> the time machine. Yes. Back in time. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks again. It was nice talking thanks about so much, you. Tom. Okay. Great. Have a good Bye. one. Yeah. Bye-bye.